This is Rob Gray from ASU and PerceptionAction.com. Today on the Perception in Action podcast, my interview with Len Zakowski and Dan Peterson about their recently released book, The Playmaker's Advantage, How to Raise Your Mental Game to the Next Level. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, my interview with Len and Dan, authors of the really interesting new book, The Playmaker's Advantage. Len Zakowski is one of the pioneers of sports psychology in North America. He started one of the first graduate programs in the area at Boston University and has consulted with teams in almost every sport you can think of. Dan Peterson worked for years in the health technology industry and has now followed his passion and curiosity into the area of neuroscience and sport. As you will hear, the book covers a lot of the topics I regularly discuss on the podcast, including decision-making, perceptual cognitive training, pressure-proofing athletes, and transfer. In the interview, we discuss what is a playmaker? Can you train this ability? How do you separate good from bad training technologies? How can you prepare athletes to make good decisions under pressure? And how do coaches and researchers differ in the way they see these topics? Hope you enjoy. Not 10 years ago, I was a child. I was a good boy and you let me go. Now I'm on a talk show, talk show. Okay, today my guests are Len Zakowski and Daniel Peterson, authors of the newly released book, the Playmaker's Advantage, How to Raise Your Mental Game to the Next Level. Thank you both for taking some time to talk with me today. Very happy thank to be here, Thank you for having us, Rob. It's an honor to be with you. <laughs> Great. Thank you. And so to start off with, can I uh, get you to tell us a little bit about uh, each of your backgrounds? Maybe we'll start with you, Len. Okay, uh, Rob. Uh, thanks. Uh, well, you know, I grew up in northern Alberta, north of Edmonton, quite a ways. And uh, I always wanted to be a teacher and a coach from as a youngster. And uh, Went to the University of Alberta, got my undergraduate degree in, in physical education and, in, and into education, and got a great job in the middle of, of the province in Stetler, Alberta, where just a sport-crazy town, and I was able to practice what I was hoping to do, to be a great coach and a, and a, and a teacher of, of young men and women. And I realized after a couple of years that I knew so little about psychology, and I understood that psychology was an important part of athlete performance. So was off to grad school, and I went to the University of Oklahoma to get a, my master's degree in uh, psychology, and then they talked me into getting a PhD, so I went to the University of Toledo and and had a, a wonderful interdisciplinary program that got me into into what they call neuroanatomy then and what we call now neuroscience, and I combined that with my passion for, for sport and psychology and education. Then it was, uh, the jobs were tight then, but there was a one year opening at Boston University and uh, I applied, got it and, uh, was there for 38 years. Um, you come to the, you come, like Yogi Bear said, you come to the ro- fork in the road and you take it. And that was it. And, uh, it, Boston was such a great place for me to start a, a program in, uh, sports psychology, one of the first uh, graduate training programs in the country. And um, everything took off. You know, I did the typical academic stuff of publishing good research and uh, teaching grad students. And uh, the, the other thing that BU afforded me was the ability to, to consult. And, uh, and I really enjoyed doing that, uh, testing out my ideas and with high-performance sports and, and also with young kids as well, too. And uh, it was at that time that I kind of developed my I always did have an interest in trying to understand who the, the, these outstanding athletes were, as we call them in the book, Playmaker. And that continued to grow. And gosh, we ended up getting David Hemmer's dissertation there in the mid-1980s, which is kind of the first of its kind to look at who these people really are. And that was uh, turned into 38 wonderful years. And uh, here I am. <laughs> That's great. Um, and Dan, how about you? Well, I've Certainly a different path than a lot of your guests, Rob. Um, so I spent 25 years in health information technology and uh, went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison um, and then at Milwaukee and got my master's degree in technology. But my interest in this topic really started uh, as a sports dad 
We have three sons who were very active in sports, playing all different kinds of sports. And for whatever reason, I, instead of maybe just cheering them on on the sideline, I always was fascinated by watching these young guys and understanding, like, how did they learn those skills? And I, for 15 years, I've had a very strong interest in the brain. And I've always been curious about how young athletes learn those skills how they can handle all the complexity and confusion on a playing field, even when they're young to high school and beyond, and how do they make those decisions, et cetera. And so I just kind of started reading everything I can on it and started writing articles, started a blog about eight or nine years ago, and just let that, you know, that was kind of my side passion to a point where a few years ago, I had a conversation with my wife and I said, you know, there's so much going on in this other area, you know, I could probably make a go of it. And she goes, well, it's now or never. So take, you know, go for it. And so I, um, I've worked with several sports science companies and at a couple of those, that's where Len and I met. And, uh, I've always enjoyed talking to Len and obviously his experience and his career. Uh, he's been looking at those subjects from a much more disciplined and research orientation and uh, I approached him about a year, well, a year and a half ago and uh, said, hey, Len, you want to write a book? <laughs> and <laughs> Len was very gracious. And he said, you know, I, I wouldn't mind that. I've written textbooks before, but nothing uh, a trade book. And so that's why we got together uh, about a year and a half ago. And we learned a lot about the publishing business and how to get an agent and how to get a publisher. And two days ago, the book came out. It's on the bookshelves now. So it's been a fun journey, and I appreciate Len uh, coming along for it. Well, that's great. And and I guess, um, you know, you mentioned, uh, Len mentioned the the Playmaker. The So the book's called The Playmaker's Advantage. And Playmaker's a, kind of a term you hear announcers throw around kind of loosely. But it's kind of central to your, to your book, kind of defining it a bit more exactly. So maybe starting with you, Dan, can you tell us a little bit about how you define the term Playmaker? Yeah. And, you know, Len and I talked about this a lot because we knew in the book we wanted to focus on the cognitive side of athletes. But we also knew that if we wanted to appeal to a general audience of parents and coaches, that we couldn't throw a lot, throw around a lot of very scientific terms, cognitive and, and uh, visual perception and these things. So we wanted to find a term that most sports fans, parents, coaches understood and, and we landed on playmaker because everyone kind of has their own definition of playmaker. In fact, for all the interviews we did for this book with coaches, athletes, uh, researchers, we would always start the interview with, what is your definition of a playmaker? And in fact, those were so entertaining. We put uh, several of them in the book at the beginning of, of chapters just to get different perspectives of, of what these folks thought a playmaker was. The term, or the phrase we heard mostly from coaches, et cetera, was, uh, in a general sense, they make their, the teammates around them better. Of course, from the scientific side, we wanted to drill down and say, that's exactly the question we're trying to answer. What makes them better, and how did they learn to do that? And so that's what we uh, started to go with, is just, we knew they were narrowing down that they maybe have superior awareness, perception, decision-making skills especially under stressful situations. But that's what we wanted to dig into in this book is, why are those athletes different? And how did they get that way? And can you train other athletes to have those qualities? If I could add, if I sure, could add yeah, to definitely. that, to Rob, too. Yeah, it, it's, uh, yeah, for sure, it's a sport term. We were, it was important because cognition was just kind of have too many eyes rolling. Uh, and it, so it, it's a sport term for sure. But everybody could certainly relate to it. The athletes and coaches similarly defined it. I want to expand upon it a little bit too, and I gave several examples that in every discipline, there is a playmaker, somebody who, who makes everybody around them better, whatever they're doing. And, and, and you would probably appreciate this, Rob, and I got to know Albert Bandura so well, and he's an amazing man and all the work he's done. He always performed well on the, under pressure and made everybody else around him at Stanford and the whole psychology feel better. And I, I, I wrote quite a bit about him and referred to him as if there was a playmaker in psychology, it would be Albert Bandura. 
And, you know, we can think of any, any discipline and, and that really applies that, uh, and we're always searching for them, uh, for, for this person who can always perform under pressure and execute upon demand. Yeah. Well, that's great. And, and I guess as a follow up to, to you, Len, maybe I ask, you know, why did, why did you decide to write about this topic now? Uh, you know, why do you think it's kind of an important thing to be discussing at, at the, this, mo- this point in time? Well, yeah, that's, that's a wonderful lead in, uh, Rob, uh, kind of why now? Well, it, to me, it was really clear, uh, even at kind of the end of my tenure at Boston University and getting into the consulting world and high performance sport that it, th- this field, kind of the, the, the perceptual cognitive action area was really missing. It, uh, and partly because, you know, we really couldn't measure it very well. So forever, if you look at the NBA, NFL, NHL, the major sports soccer, uh, when they're trying to identify talent or, uh, as we might say in, in, in psychology, looking for this expert or champion performer or what we're calling the playmaker, they go after fitness parameters, strength and speed, kind of the mechanics of how they do things. And then more recently, they've gone into things like diet, what, you know, looking at that and, and sleep even more recently. And yeah, there was some mention of mental skills and being able to relax at the right time and those sorts of things. But uh, from my perspective, that wasn't enough. And so it's kind of been the missing domain. And it's time that you had to move on it. So this is going to hope. I was hoping this would be my party shot, Rob. Uh, <laughs> I've tried for years as an academic to, to convince the, the sports world that the cognitive area a perceptual cognitive area was really important. And I didn't think enough people were paying attention. So the time is now. So uh, when Dan approached me about working on this book, I thought, well, I'll take one more shot at this. And I'm, I'm hoping that we can, we can actually make a difference. So perhaps I'm dreaming, but that's kind of the answer to your question, kind of the why. You know, kind of writing about this in, in ta- in, intangible thing that some people call that, uh, it, but it's, they recognize it's important to high performance, but nobody's really done much about it. And we, we're hoping we, we, we've done something. Yeah. Do you, do you want to add something there, Dan? Or? Yeah, I, I agree with Len. I think also for the millions of kids playing sports and beneath maybe the high school level, there's just a lot of, dads like I was, you know, uh, volunteer coaches, maybe some at the high school ranks, who certainly have coached for a long time and have a lot of experience. But when we've talked to a lot of the coaches for the book, they they all are still starting to recognize that, you know, this is um, an area that they know they should know more about. And they know it's kind of this black box. Like if I just feed in information to these kids, good things will happen. And then they wonder why you know, there's mental mistakes during games. They wonder why they didn't see the pass that they should. And so I think what we're trying to do, as, as you're trying to do with your podcast, is, you know, introduce a vocabulary, introduce a way to talk about these issues that can really move it from research in the lab, you know, out to the, the playing field. Yeah, no, I think that that's a totally valid point. And, you know, I get, you know, the example I might point to is the NFL combine is a great example of the lack of uh, perception. The only cognitive thing there is the Wonderlick IQ test, which is completely <laughs> unrelated to football. But, but anyway, but another thing, you know, I, I think in, and you address this in your book, why it's timely is something that I'm on about a lot is there's so many, almost every day so there seems to be a new technology coming out to either evaluate or train perceptual cognibilities related to sports. So in your minds, maybe starting with you, Dan, how is, you know, people that want to use these, how do they separate, you know, the kind of snake oil from things that are kind of legitimate? You know, that's a great question. And I think we start over in the, in the brain training market. And it, it's interesting. I, I think for each of those products, the people who create them, there's very few that are out there trying to certainly not to hurt people and certainly not to be just a complete ripoff. But I think the science is emerging now as far as, sure, you can spend time doing those type of activities and trying to train those generalized skills. And there's some studies that they quote that say, okay, we improve the short-term memory after doing this exercise for X amount of time. 
But the big question, and, and Rob, you hit at this all the time in your episodes, is transfer. Transfer to what you want to improve. So if we want to make a soccer midfielder better at seeing passes and making decisions out in the field, will training their vision, training their short-term memory, et cetera, can we show that we've eliminated all the other variables and influences and show that there's a direct transfer and benefit to what they're doing to, out on the field? And I think that's one hard to prove. So, you know, when Len and I look at tools, we look at, okay, what's the science behind it? What studies have you done? How have you tried to show that there's this direct transfer? But then also it's just, it, it's difficult to kind of quantify did that make a difference? The other thing I learned working with another company is worked with a lot of college coaches and college athletes. And the thing they always told me was, Dan, we are regulated on how much time we can spend with an athlete every week, how many hours we can spend with an athlete. And so we have a very short supply of hours. And unless you can show us direct evidence that Doing this exercise over here to do, quote, cognitive training, unless you can show us that has absolute benefit, then we'd rather spend that hour with them on the practice field or watching film. And that was really the, I think, once we get to a point where we can show that it actually works, then coaches will start to believe and, and invest the time. I think there's several other tools and, and several that Len and I are working with are very good at assessment and assessing the cognitive skills that somebody has. But I think we're still got a ways to go in terms of training those skills. Len, what do you think? Yeah, that, that, uh, that's a real good assessment of the field as I see it. And, you know, Rob, I've been involved as a psychometrician and test developer over the years. And, and as a scientist, it's, first and foremost, you have to have an instrument that's valid and reliable, really well-structured. And it's so difficult to do, and there's a kind of a philosophy sometimes, just build it and they will come. And in the old days, that, that really happened. But I think today, uh, sport organizations are, have got pretty smart executives and smarter coaches, and, and they ask these important questions about the psychometric properties of the instrument. So, I, you know, I've kind of embraced several uh, that, that have done this. And, uh, for example, uh, Jocelyn Fulbert, uh, who has an endowed chair at the University of Montreal, he spent years developing multiple object tracking uh, as as an assessment and training tool, and I I've used it. I was one of the first to use it too, when I was consulting with the Vancouver Canucks and working for them uh, back in 2010. And uh, a lot of folks could just kind of laugh at that as a possible assessment and training device. But Fulbert has done some wonderful research, and others have continued in that, in that area. And uh, he seems to have pretty good data that it is. Uh, a, a good training device uh, for decision making, and in my case, I use it primarily for uh, helping athletes focus attention. So that that's one device, and another one. My good friend Scott Goldman, who developed the athlete intelligence quotient, that kind of looks at more at executive functions and measures this thing that we don't like to don't like to use the term of intelligence, but that's what he he went after, and he calls it the athlete intelligence quotient. That has gotten a lot of traction in the pro sports world, in the college world, and it has strong theoretical validity based on Cattell Horn Carroll theory of intelligence. And at this, in 2018, he's getting a lot of traction and uh, doing full time consulting along with with that instrument. And then something that I pointed out earlier is that now we're at the point where we can measure some of these cognitive functions, and we can measure them. Then hopefully now we can develop training methods to do that. And I know you wanted to talk a little bit about that, and we'll get to that later. But those are a couple of uh, devices that uh, I was able to kind of separate real good science from snake oil. And uh, I'm sure there'll be others that'll be coming along to that are even better. Yeah, no, I think those are all really good points you're, you're both making uh, about the the area, the where it stands now, and kind of where it needs to go. And you mentioned, you know, kind of terminology, and another one you use in your book that I wanted to, to ask you about, maybe starting with you, uh, Len, this time is uh, athlete cognition. So can you tell us a little bit about how you use that term? Well, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, an interesting uh, concept uh, and why we didn't have it in the title. But it, it's really, uh, you know, academics would certainly relate to it. 
but but the average person would not. It's kind of try to separate it out from something we might call intelligence that Scott Goldman got into. And as I said, you know, it's not a term that a lot of people like to use, but in fact, that's it is related to con- cognition. Cognition is more of a process, as I see it, of, of thinking. And it's a rather complex phenomena that, that kind of gets into the the whole seeing and deciding and executing our abilities to to to, to perceive and to learn and to reason. And it typically involves a test. And uh, whenever one mentions intelligence, we, we start thinking of traditional intelligence tests. But uh, there were related concepts to be sure. In a in the in the book, we try to describe this whole process of kind of uh, seeing what's out on the field, making good, quick, accurate decisions, and then finally executing with expertise. That's my take on it, and uh, maybe Dan would want to expand on that too. No, I think that's exactly it, and I I, I realize scientists and researchers love it when books just start creating terms. But we just wanted to, like Playmaker, we wanted to, you know, start this vocabulary that people can talk about. And it, the, the book is mainly meant for coaches, parents, those trying to implement some of this. And athlete cognition, we broke it down in the book, like Len said, in, in three chapters, search, decide, and execute. Because what we saw was for an athlete on the field, and, and we focus mainly in the book on team sports and especially invasion-type sports, flowing sports like soccer, hockey, lacrosse, things where you're up and down the field a lot, constantly making decisions where the, the action doesn't stop. And you just see that cycle in their eyes. And they're constantly searching, constantly perceiving, constantly taking in information and then making hundreds of decisions during a game, little decisions, go left, go right, pass here, shoot, uh, get your uh, man covered, etc. And then the ability to execute those with sports skills. They may know the decision, they need the move they need to make, but do they have the skills to actually make that? And it just seemed like a constant loop. Uh, and that's what we're referring to as athlete cognition. And I think that's, it's so sports specific that that's where we say a lot of that has to be trained. The idea is they can't play their sport, you know, eight hours a day. So if they do have some extra time, what are some other technologies and ways that they can maybe improve some of those skills as they go? That's really good. And um, I know another thing that you emphasize in the book, and I know I actually talked to you about, was uh, the, the issue of performing under pressure. So maybe starting with you, Dan, this time, can you talk a little bit about that and some of the things that you, you know, identified as ways that coaches can design practice to kind of better mimic the kind of competitive pressure an athlete's going to face in, in the real thing? Yeah, absolutely. And we really appreciate taking time to interview for our book. And we, we looked at a lot of your research and the research you did with, with uh, Professor Bylock. And what I learned there, uh, Len had already seen a lot of this material, was just your delineation, and please help me if I get this wrong, but the difference between the two different theories of, of choking, if you will, distraction theory and explicit monitoring theory. And what it, what you showed with Dr. Bylock is the evidence shows it's more on an explicit monitoring. In other words, when somebody gets out of their automaticity, when somebody starts thinking about their swing or thinking about their kicking motion or thinking about what they have to do next in the skill through, for whatever reason, pressure, stress, et cetera, that's when they make mistakes and that's where they have a opportunity to choke there. And so I think what coaches try to do is, and we're, what we're recommending to coaches is you have to simulate game situations in practice. And whether that means, you know, you make it a competitive, I know you did some of that in your research, Rob, you make a, a practice drill competitive, you have a reward or a punishment on the line, bring in some noise and stress, and you try to stop them from, from monitoring explicitly and getting them out of their groove. And that way they can, uh, when they, they get into the game, they've already experienced that type of stress before. And I think a lot of coaches are starting to turn to that. And also just breaking the game down into components where they can experience that stress. 
Yeah, I think that's and the other point I know, Rob, you were making was the idea of implicit learning. So in other words, when you learn a new sports skill, don't necessarily break it down into parts, but learn the whole skill as one. I think the example used is always, you know, when you learn to ride a bike, you don't work on pedaling one day and steering the next day and balance the next day. You work on riding a bike all, all in one. And if you learn it that way, then it can't get broken down into parts when you're under stress. So, Len, what do, what do you think about that? No, that's pretty much spot on. And Rob, you, you've done some excellent work in this area. And uh, certainly we relied on a lot of your good research and, and your, your, your writings on this as well, too. And one of the concepts I'd like to add, too, is uh, came out of the hockey world and, and from a physiologist who talked about overspeed training to really uh, attack the, phys- the physical system that kids who are skating in circles skate as fast as they can. And if they fall down, that's fine. Get up and and go as fast as you can and, and not try to stay on your feet. The whole idea is to kind of overload the system. We call it overspeed training. And I think we can do the same thing with the cognitive system. Overspeed training for the brain, I call it. And so we can create creatively. We, coaches can do that in practices to do kind of overspeed training for the, for the brain. So put them in a tight area, small area areas to train and just keep expanding it and having them make decisions as quickly as possible. So it's a concept that uh, coaches are, are integrating more and more, and uh, you know the wise ones are doing this. Uh, and for, me, for many years, they've been doing this tight area drills and, and didn't know why they were doing it. it was, it's interesting, Rob. I was in Australia for a couple of months here in March and April and went to many practices of Aussie rules football and soccer. And I saw them doing some of these small area drills and asked them why they were doing it. <laughs> and... Almost every reason, except to say that, you know, we're trying to get them to think faster and make quicker, better decisions. It was rather interesting. So, you know, it's, it's a drill that they modeled from observing other coaches doing it, but never knew why they were doing it. So I found that kind of interesting. No, that is really interesting. And, and, and one of the things I, I really like about the, your book is, you know, the emphasis on the trainability of these things. And, you know, we tend to think, you know, especially with, you know, terms like playmaker, you tend to think of their more kind of innate (laughs) abilities that an athlete has. They either do or they don't. So, Len, I don't know if you have anything else. We already talked about training a bit, but is there anything else you want to add about uh, how you can train these skills uh, that you're talking about? Well, I mentioned earlier Fulbert's work with the multiple object tracking, which is a very general method of helping athletes track multiple objects and and pay attention. But as we got into more specific things, I've been involved with some colleagues in developing a company that does uh, occlusion training for pitch recognition in baseball, pitch recognition in softball, tennis serve recognition using a method of occlusion. It's very specific, but it's helping athletes, you know, the, the hitters, if we use the baseball example, uh, they learn to look for specific cues from real live video of outstanding pitchers. And, you know, it took a while for that to get traction, but then finally coaches and athletes realized, God, this makes a lot of sense. You don't have to be taking at, at bats and looking for pitchers who can throw 95 miles an hour. Look at a real live video and attempt to predict from the cues that are presented for the, the cue recognition, whether it's going to be a fastball, a curveball, change up, whether it's going to be a strike or a ball. So that's kind of very specific kind of training that uh, we're trying to take beyond a sport like baseball and, and tennis and take to other fields of endeavor that that uh, use occlusion, which, of course, has been around for 30-some years since Bruce Abernathy and others used it in their basic research. Uh, we know it's an effective way of, uh, now that we have the technology, to train athletes to make uh, better decisions. Great. And Dan, did you want to add anything else on the, the training side of things? Yeah, I think those are great methods. I also think we're going to see a lot in the next few years uh, in the use of virtual reality. I think the one area that, it, again, is getting as close in the off-the-field training, getting trying to get as close in the fidelity and the look and feel of being on the field, and sometimes whether you're you know, watching film from the camera that's, you know, 50 feet above the field, it's like, well, yeah, I can recognize things there, but then 
I'm actually playing the game on the field and there's a lot of things in my way, et cetera. And so if we can make training more and more like the actual game itself, but without taxing their bodies, et cetera. So I think there's a lot of work that's going to get done in virtual reality where they can see themselves on the field. They can look around and they can move through the space in a virtual sense and make quick decisions and kind of set up scenarios where they're making constant decisions. I think what Len's doing with the the batting can move that direction. I think a lot of the, you know, put a soccer midfielder or a skater in hockey or whatever, and you can put them in those situations. And there they're training this athlete cognition uh, without uh, wearing out their bodies. No, I I agree with you. Exactly. That's going to be an interesting (laughs) development, how that develops. And um, I guess the second to last question I have is, is um, you mentioned uh, at the top that you interviewed a lot of different people from a lot of different kind of disciplines, coaches, researchers, and, and so on, which is, I, I think, a real strength of the book. And what I wanted to ask is, did you notice kind of any trends in, in the differences about the way, uh, you know, for example, coaches and researchers think about these topics? I, I think Len mentioned one in terms of coaches wanting <laughs> proof that that's actually going to work. But are, did you notice any kind of other things in that way? You know, and I, I think we did notice a difference in the vocabulary. You know, when we inter- interviewed researchers like, uh, you know, Dr. Erickson down at Florida State, uh, some of the others, they obviously have been studying this like Len has, and they used a much more scientific vocabulary. They have specific terms that they stressed. And then when we interviewed coaches and, and athletes like Sidney Crosby, coaches like Brad Stevens, Mike Sullivan, who's uh, Mike's been great. Mike was a former student of Lens and I wrote the foreword for the book. But they use terms and and things when they describe playmakers in, in a a more general way. It's kind of like these experienced coaches. They know a playmaker when they see it, see him or her. But if you were to ask them to give a scientific explanation of, well, why did you pick out that person as a playmaker? And it's more intuitive. It's just, well, I've seen plenty of players and that guy has it and that one doesn't. But what we're trying to do is bridge that gap. Researchers like yourself, Rob, others in the field have put out so much good research over the last 10, 15 years. And very little of that is, I think, getting read by coaches in in everyday life. And so we're trying to bring some of those together so that there is this common vocabulary and we thought maybe a term like playmaker, terms like athlete cognition might start to build that bridge. Yeah, you know, Dan mentioned uh, Mike Sullivan, coach of the Pittsburgh Penguins, who was my student at Boston University. Uh, I heard him give a talk uh, about three years ago uh, to the U.S. Hockey Coaches Association, and he's, he's talking to the coaches like a cognitive neuroscientist. And I, I don't remember Mike getting into that when he was a student, but he really – taught himself the importance of understanding the brain and how athletes learn from youngsters right up to the pro athletes and the fact that they learn differently. And he really embraced it. And I was stunned. And I could just see on the YouTube, the the, the glare in the the coach's eyes, that probably a hundred of them in the room saying, is this guy crazy or what? And that's when I called him and, and he jumped all over our idea and volunteered to write the forwards of the book. And that's how kind of that all happened. And that led to, he said, you've got to come to training camp and interview the best playmaker in hockey, Sidney Crosby. And so that's how that evolved. And, you know, Sid had a very different perspective, like, like you would expect from a player, but, uh, well, very thoughtful and, uh, and kind of what he, he did in, in his preparation to become as good as he did. So, uh, yeah, there were slight differences. And of course we've all, uh, heard and talked to Anders Ericsson and his perspective on the importance of deliberate practice. Coaches are understanding that a little bit. And, you know, if we have the time here, I'd like to quote a little bit about with uh, John Meinmeyer it, with the uh, Sydney Swans, who I interviewed, just a wonderful man. And this is kind of what, what Meinmeyer said. He says, athletes come to us having mastered most of the technical demands of the game, such as kicking, advancing the ball, catching and tackling. But without question, the biggest challenge our coaches face is teaching our players how to make quick and accurate decisions on the field. So as coaches, we've learned how to make our players stronger, faster, more fit through our sports science programs. We review a lot of video, structure training to simulate games as much as we can. 
But we have not come up with a good strategy for teaching perhaps the most important skill in our sport, decision-making. Since all players are capable of making decisions on the field, but when the game is perceived as important, that we talked about earlier, this psychological pressure changes how a player makes decisions. Likewise, when your opponent applies a lot of pressure by taking away time and space, decision-making is affected. So our greatest challenge is now to creatively teach decision-making. And he said, he ended with, do you have any advice for us? And, you know, I got that from so many coaches. Now, do you have any advice? So there's a changing climate there, Rob. And I'm optimistic that there's going to be a, a slow but constant move into the cognitive psychology area as part of high performance training. Yeah, that's, that's great. I, lo- I really like that quote. And I guess that, that leads me nicely into the last question. I know, as Dan mentioned, the book came out a couple of days ago, or you mentioned, and I think I've heard, I saw a tweet from Dan saying there's an audio version. So I know coaches drive a lot. So that might be a, a good, <laughs> oh, yeah. good use. But, <laughs> Scouting, they're looking, they're looking for that talent, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I guess, the, but the last thing I want to mention is, you know, uh, where can people kind of go for a bit more information? And if they want to know how this applies to, their own specific sports, you know, uh, how can they find out more, maybe contact you? Well, first of all, thank you for mentioning the book. It, it's available now. Uh, it should be in your local bookstore if you're in the U.S. Uh, we also are getting it out to around the world. Uh, but there is a hardcover edition, an ebook edition, and as you mentioned, an audiobook uh, version that really came out nice. We, we liked how that turned out. Also, Len and I are involved, partnered up in a uh, consulting firm called 80% Mental Consulting. And we are at 80% Mental, that's 80percentmental.com. Percent is the word. And I'm on Twitter, Daniel Peterson uh, at Twitter. And really what we're focused on is working with teams, working with coaches, either assessment and talking about some of their, it just as, as Coach Longmire from the Sydney Swans said, Come in and help us understand how we make decisions. They're the, the coaches are the experts in the sport. We're not in there to draw X's and O's on the chalkboard, but to come in and do assessments of their players to understand uh, a little bit more about their cognitive traits. And then some of the strategies and things we have in the book of how they can implement those in their practices and with their teams. And it's interesting that, you know, we bring up decision making. Len and I are, are, uh, brainstorming, uh, the follow-up to this book, and we, we were, we're pretty sure that the the focus and the thing we hear most from coaches is that's a nice overview that you have in the first book. Now zero in on decision making as a as a science, and so we may go that direction as well. But appreciate appreciate the mentions, Rob. Oh, that's great. That's great. Uh, I was going to ask about a follow-up book, but I didn't want to, you know, when it just came out, that might be a little, put you put in a cart before the horse. So um, this was really great. I'd like to thank you both for taking some time to talk with me. Thank you, Rob, very well, thank much. Thank you for having us on. You were wonderful. Great question. Thank you. Thank you both again for the great discussion. You can find out more about Len and Dan and the Playmaker's Advantage from the links I've included in the show notes. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including transcripts and an extra monthly episode, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perceptionaction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. We'll cut you quick.